a man fell in a hole. He fell in a hole and he couldn't get out. A traveler passed by. He told the man to meditate, to purify his mind. And when he reached nirvana, all suffering would cease. The man did as he was told, but he remained in the hole. Another man appeared. He explained that the hole didn't exist, and neither, in fact, did the man. It was all an illusion. The man who didn't exist was still stuck in the hole that was not there. Another visitor arrived. He instructed the man to perform good deeds to improve his karma, and though he would still die in the hole, he might be reincarnated as something magnificent. The man remained in the hole. Another man looked down from above. He told the man to pray five times a day facing east and follow five important tenets. If he was faithful, one day, perhaps, divine would set him free. The man prayed the best he could, but he was losing strength, and in the hole he remained. Another man appeared. There was something different about him. He called down to the man in the hole and asked if he wanted to be freed. Then the man threw in a rope and lowered himself into the pit. He took hold of the man and dragged him into the light. And the man in the hole who couldn't get himself out was saved. Do you get it? Of course you do. Jesus is God who has become our salvation. Other religions either have no God at all or have gods that you must please in order to gain their favor. Not so with Jesus. He's the God who came to us, who came to save us. And although I I feel it fitting to close this video today with a song entitled, When He Reached Down His Hand For Me. I want to emphasize that he didn't just reach down from heaven. He came down from heaven. He wrapped himself in human flesh, and by his life and his death, he provided for us a pathway back to himself. He did that for us. And there's no other so-called religion on the earth that has ever been able to say that. Jesus says in John chapter 6, verses 37 and 38, All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will, I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Hello and welcome. You found the weekly Bible study from the Corinth Baptist Church in Singleton, Mississippi, and I'm, I'm glad you're here. This is going to be our third in our series under the general heading of Irrefutable Prophecies That Point Us to Jesus. The title of today's study is The Savior Who Came to Us. We'll be drawing scripture from the second chapter of the Gospel of Luke. You know, 
the paths of our lives are shaped by, yes, our, our personal decisions that we do control. And they're also shaped by those world events over which we have no control at all, like, like wars or, or pandemics or the economy. But the greatest impact on our lives comes from two events that occurred a couple of millennia ago. That would be the birth of Jesus and, a little over three decades later, his resurrection from the dead. As I alluded to earlier, we don't get good to get God. We get God to get good. The truth is that there's nothing we can do to save ourselves from God's righteous judgment. Consider for a moment, if you will, what the prophet Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 64 and verse 6. All of us have become like something unclean, and all of our righteous acts are like a polluted garment. All of us wither like a leaf, and our iniquities carry us away like the wind. God is telling us through that prophet Isaiah that no matter how hard we try, our best still is not good enough. There's a lot of people out there that are in rebellion to God. When you tell them that their best is not good enough, they rebel even more. Don't do that. Listen and learn and study and pray and seek that real light that's right there in front of every one of us in our Bibles. And I'm glad, overjoyed, honored, and duty-bound to try to explain these things to you. We've been born under a curse of sin, thanks to Adam and Eve's first sin. All right, there's no way for us to cleanse ourselves. God is holy, sinless, and pure. We cannot approach him and be in his presence with the stain of sin on us. But God has made a way. That's the miracle that we call Christmas. God came to earth at the birth of Jesus. At that time, he set in motion the events that would make our salvation possible. In Luke chapter 1, we learn how God chose a young woman named Mary to be the mother of his son. From Matthew chapter 1, we learn that God selected Joseph to be her husband. Both of these apostles, Luke and Matthew, make it clear, however, that this child was not conceived in the ordinary way, but by the miraculous power of the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit, so that he could be the Savior of the world. Let's read Luke chapter 2, verses 4 through 7. Joseph of Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth into Galilee, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of the family line. He was of the house and family line of David. And he came up there to be registered along with Mary, who was engaged to him and pregnant. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. Then she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him tightly in cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Now, this group of Bible studies that we're in right now are all about the irrefutable proof that Jesus did, in fact, fulfill every prophecy in the Old Testament about him, 
from his birth all the way through to his death, his resurrection from the grave to his ascension back into heaven, and even the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Now I ask you, as we study these prophecies and we see how they're fulfilled in Jesus, could any reasonable person who sees how God has fulfilled his promises all the way through still not believe that he's faithful to fulfill those in the Bible that are yet to occur? The prophet Micah right lived lived the prophet Micah lived seven hundred years before Christ. In Micah chapter 5, verse 2, he wrote this, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, you are small among the clans of Judah. One will come from you to be ruler over Israel for me. His origin is from antiquity, from eternity. Before there was anything, he was there. He's God. Let's go on. If you'll remember in the second chapter of Matthew, the three wise men came to King Herod asking, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw a star in the east, and we have come to worship him. When the wise men had left the palace, King Herod called his priest and his scribes and he asked them where the Messiah was supposed to be born. They pointed to that same prophecy in Micah and they quoted it like this, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah, because out of you will come a leader who will shepherd my people, Israel. It was through the ancestry of Joseph where the prophecy of 2 Samuel 7.16 reveals that God's promise to King David was fulfilled. It said, Your house and kingdom will endure before me forever and your throne will be established forever. It's not always easy to prepare for these Bible studies. It's not because it's hard to find material to put together for them. It's because the amount of material is often overwhelming. It grieves me when I, I find that I must omit things, wonderful things, because they're just an just isn't enough time to include all of them in the video. Now, at the time of Jesus' birth, the Roman Empire was vast. In order to ensure its subjects paid their taxes, the empire would regularly call for a census, a registration that required everyone to travel to the city of their birth to the one their family was from. Now, that wasn't just Israel. That was all over the Roman Empire, all the way around the Mediterranean. Now, I want to ask you, would Jesus have been born in Bethlehem if it hadn't been for the Roman census? Well, let's see. Details are sketchy, but it appears that Joseph was actually born in Bethlehem himself. We don't know why he would have moved off to, up to Nazareth of Galilee, but we do know that it was about 80 miles to the north, and it was probably a three- or four-day journey. Everybody walked, unless they were rich enough to have horses and carriages, which really didn't get them there much faster. It probably took them a bit more than three or four days with Mary being nine months long, okay? I can't imagine 
any man loading his pregnant wife up on a donkey and striking off on a journey like that for any reason. So I'll, I'll put this to you. Do you believe God's providence was at work here? We've studied prov providence previously, okay? Our all-powerful God and all-knowing God has a plan. From the very beginning, he's been orchestrating everything. Like a master weaver, he's taken the decisions of man and carefully threading them in such a way that his will will be carried out. I submit to you that we can point to not a single thing that is the cause for other things happening. It's all woven together. So the providence of God was the reason Joseph ended up in Nazareth. That was where Mary was. We don't know exactly when Joseph and Mary were actually married. The word engaged in verse 3 uh, can be more than a little confusion and to us confusing to us, us Westerners in these times. Yet, I believe they had already been married for months because of Matthew chapter 1, verse 24. In it, the verse says that Joseph, after awakening from the dream where the angel told him not to be afraid, that he married her. That's what the verse says, and that's what I believe. Other Bible scholars point out that she wouldn't have been traveling with him to Bethlehem for that registration had they not already been married. I'm afraid I'm getting bogged down in details today. Let's skip ahead to the next section of scripture. It's Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 12. In the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields, keeping watch at night over their flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid. Look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the city of David, a Savior was born for you who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. Hmm. First of all, most of us have already heard it. December the 25th is also the middle of the winter in Israel. And just like here, that would have probably been a very cold night. Sheep would have been kept in a sheepfold, a pen or a shelter on a cold winter night, not out grazing in the fields. Shepherds wouldn't have been out in the countryside at night watching their animals graze on a cold winter night. Now, my pastor most eloquently stated last Sunday that this is the time of the year, the season that we choose to celebrate the birth of our Christ. The winter solstice this year is on December the 21st. This solstice was a pagan holiday one that was celebrated by feast, visiting, gift-giving, making cakes, and general merriment. They even decorated trees and burned what we call the Yuletide log the evening before, and they hung outside ornaments on the trees. What we, Christ, what we call Christmas 
was celebrated until over 300 years after Jesus' time. So, yes, we do understand many of the roots that are our Christian celebration of the birth of Jesus come out of old pagan beginnings. And yet, just as my pastor said last Sunday, this is the time we choose to celebrate his birth. If I had to say, based on the things that I've read, I'd have to say that he was probably born in late April. Does it matter? Where in the Bible are birthdays celebrated? I can think of two right off my hand, right off head, and both of them were celebrated for evil kings. People didn't celebrate their birthdays. The people of the Bible did mark their birthdays because scripture often records their ages. But there's a big difference between marking a day and celebrating. One acknowledges its passing while the other honors it. There are reams and reams written about whether Christians should celebrate birthdays or not, including Jesus's. I say it's all about the heart. In the book of Acts, there arose a huge stink over whether Gentiles could be saved if they had not been circumcised. A party accompanied Paul to Jerusalem to seek the apostles for their views on this. Their meeting is called the Council of Jerusalem. It's recorded in Acts chapter 15. They returned to the north with a letter and with messengers that were sent by the apostles with the news. The council decreed that the Gentiles did not have to observe the Mosaic laws of the Jews. They were admonished instead from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from meat of strangled animals, and from blood. The instructions were not intended to guarantee salvation, but to promote peace in the early church. So you see, the timing of things, and even the celebrations of things, is not what matters. It's what's in the heart that does. That's the place where we meet God, and that's the place where God looks to determine anything about a person. Did the Council of Jerusalem say anything about whether we should or should not celebrate things? In the Mosaic Law, there are holy feast days that the Jews are to celebrate. But those are for the Jewish people under the Mosaic Laws. They've got a different heritage. The Jews are God's chosen people. And yes, some of the Jews are Christians, but the overwhelming majority of them from the days of Jesus until now are not. The church, on the other hand, is at this moment the temple of God. The church is also the bride of Christ, and I believe that very soon he is going to return and take his bride away from this sinful world, so y'all be ready. But back to the shepherds. They were out in the countryside that night. All of a sudden, an angel most assuredly in the form of a man suddenly appeared in front of them. As he appeared, the whole area lit up with bright light. We've read of this brightness that's called the glory of the Lord in other places in our Bibles. wasn't unique here. I'm here to tell you, 
If you were sitting peacefully by your campfire and all of a sudden someone appeared out of a brilliant burst of light, it would most likely scare the dick inside of you too. I know it would me. The shepherds were terrified. The very first thing out of that angel's mouth was to tell them not to be afraid. Many books could and probably have been written about that one statement. Do not be afraid. It's one of those places I had to keep from going down another rabbit hole. But this angel, once he had said that to him, he told him the good news that the Savior had been born in Bethlehem and how they could find him. Something that I, I would like to bring out is that the lambs that these men raised were mostly intended for sale to the priest in the temple in Jerusalem for sacrifice. Bethlehem is really close to Jerusalem. These men sold lambs to be sacrificed to God. So why did God choose to reveal the, the wonderful news that the Messiah had been born to shepherds? Shepherds were pretty much considered unclean, and they were viewed very low on the social order of the people in Israel. Did God choose to reveal the news to these humble men as a gesture to the world that he loved and cherished all people? From the lowest to the highest? Or could it be to associate the pure and unblemished sacrificial lambs to Jesus, the Lamb of God? Could it be both? Could it be even more? Who can know with certainty the mind of God? The angel told them the good news of great joy that will be for all people. The shepherds most likely understood these words to mean the Jewish people. They knew God was the Savior of the Jews, and that he had rescued or saved them from slavery in, in Egypt, and he had fought for them in several battles with their enemies. They had no way of knowing that the all people the angel spoke of would mean, it, would mean that literally, all people. Yet, they were aware that God had promised a Messiah, a Savior in the prophets, and just like many generations before them, they had longed for the day when he would finally come. What exciting news. The Messiah refers to the anointed, uh, the anointed one. This child would be empowered by God. All through the Old Testament, we read of prophets, kings, and priests being anointed by God for their specific roles in service to Him. Only this child, this Jesus, could be the one to combine all these roles as high priest, as king, and as prophet. The angel didn't only refer to Jesus as Savior and as the Messiah, he also called him the Lord. All through the Bible, down through the ages, the word Lord is often used in addressing people out of honor and respect, human beings not just God. I've even heard of wives calling their husbands their lords, but I'm sure most wives today would balk at these. They wouldn't do that. 
I don't know of any woman that would call her husband Lord and mean it. It's the sign of the times. The angel was making it very clear to these simple shepherds that this was no ordinary child born in the city of David that night. Before we move on, though, let's focus on something else that the angel said. In verse 11, he says, A Savior was born for you. I emphasize that because the angel was speaking directly to those shepherds. He was plainly stating that the Messiah had come even for the sake of humble shepherds. From the heights of fame and fortune to the depths of shame and poverty, Jesus had come from heaven to be the Savior of mankind. He had come to provide for sinful man a way to God and to salvation. The final section of our study for today comes from Luke chapter 2. It's verses 16 through 20. They hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. After seeing them, they reported the message that they were told about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary was treasuring up the, all these things in her heart and meditating on them. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had seen and heard, which were just as they had been told. As if it weren't enough for a single angel to come to the shepherds and proclaim the good news of the birth of Jesus, in verses 13 and 14, the Bible says that suddenly there was a multitude of heavenly hosts that were there with that angel, and that they were praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace and goodwill toward men. If the first one didn't convince them, that certainly did. After the angels had gone back to heaven, those shepherds ran into Bethlehem knowing exactly what they were looking for. They found him, worshipped him, went out into the village proclaiming the good news and even returned and worshipped some more. So angels came to Mary, to Joseph, and to the shepherds. If the whole world chose to doubt and reject that Jesus was the anointed one sent by God himself to be the savior of the entire world, this small group knew the truth. Jesus came into the world to save his people from their sins. All of the people are his people. He created all of us. Why? Must we be saved from our sins? Because the Bible cl clearly teaches us that the wages of sin is death. Death, according to the dictionary, is the cessation of vital function or lack of life. Spiritual death is our natural state prior to accepting Christ as our Savior. And you can verify this by reading Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 and Colossians chapter 2 verse 13. It's a lack of spiritual life, an absence of proper spiritual functioning. Now, I'm going to deviate from what I've written and tried to present to you. We think of death, that it comes at the end of our lives. We've been born into sin. The wages of sin is death. God pays our wages. We are 
dead, even though we're alive and functioning bodily, we're spiritually dead and we'll stay dead until we're saved, until we come to Jesus, until we are born again, born of the Spirit, born from above. All right, let me get back to this. Well, I'm, I'm just trying to make sure that everybody understands death spiritually is what everyone has until they're saved. Once you're saved, once you're born again, once you have God's Holy Spirit inside of you, then you're alive spiritually. And guess what? You're going to live forever. I'm not going to go into once saved, always saved, but what I'm trying to say is it's worth it. It's worth it. Life, finally, after years of not understanding the light shines into your heart and into your mind and into your soul and you realize you have been born and you're now alive, both physically and spiritually. So what if the body dies? You're alive. Now, because of unrepented sin and a lack of forgiveness for it, that sin renders us spiritually dead. So, in the only sense that's truly important, people who haven't been born again, born anew by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, they're already dead. I know I'm repeating myself, but I'm trying to make sure that you understand. True life and life eternal can only come from God's Spirit. In the end, the choice is yours. Stay dead or come to the source of life and be saved from that terrible end that is sin. Jesus made it clear to us that he will not turn away anyone who comes to him. Let's pray. Father, we were once dead. And some of us are now alive. We are now filled with your spirit. And we know that we're going to be with you forever and ever. Doesn't matter that the body dies. We have the life that is you in our souls. And we thank you, Lord for not turning us away when we came to you. We thank you, Lord, for not just reaching down for us, but coming down to provide us a way to be with you forever and not have to worry about death. You're our God. You're our master most importantly right now you are our savior I ask you dear Lord if there's anyone listening to this video at this point please touch their hearts let them hear your call and please Lord let them come to you because you have promised us you would not turn them away Help them, Lord. Fill them with your spirit. Let them be born again. Let them be born into eternity with a huge, huge un, un, unnumberable host of others who have been sealed by your spirit. This earth and all of the wickedness in it 
you're going to wipe it away. And we will be there with no sin, no pain, no grief. And we will experience something that man lost in the Garden of Eden all those years ago. Peace and harmony and life eternal. I can't wait. Thank you for being my God. Thank you for being my Savior. And thank you for giving me the ability to produce these videos to reach out to my brothers and sisters who have not yet been born again and those who have to help them to learn you and your ways and your precepts. I say all these things, Lord, in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for being with me today, and I'll try to have you another video out in about a week. Bye-bye for now. February 6th, 1989, Westside Baptist Church, Jacksonville, Florida. It was there that the master reached down, grabbed hold of this old boy's heart, and it was there that the master saved him and changed him. And oh, listen, friend. Now my heart does rejoice. Since I made him my choice From the tempest To him I can flee I just lean on his arm Safe, secure From all harm Since he reached down his hand For